I wonder if you have shed any tears this last week. It's one of those things I think that few would want to acknowledge. Maybe you experienced pain this last week due to a dentist appointment or maybe no one else saw but you actually shed a tear because of the pain. Perhaps you experienced grief, deep grief because of some relationship issue. Tears this last week have welled up in your eyes. Maybe there's some in this congregation last week shedding tears muffled into your pillow due to your deep troubles. Or perhaps the reality maybe of the state of the Christian church in our own country has recently hit you, it's impacted your heart and you've been deeply troubled and tears shed tears for the current spiritual condition of God's people even in our own land. Tenderness is not seen much as a virtue in our day. Toughness seems to be. But tenderness, the world tells us that grown men don't cry. Well, that's not true of godly men. It's not true of godly women and it's certainly not true of the Son of God. On three separate occasions in the New Testament, shed tears. That Jesus wept. The first of those three occasions relates, many of you will know this one, probably the first one that comes into your mind, relates to the death of Lazarus. Jesus sees Mary weeping and all the commotion uh, related to the death of his friend and John, the shortest of all verses, Jesus wept. On another occasion, Jesus approached Jerusalem. We read it just before in Luke's account. It says, Jesus wept over the city. The last occasion is found tucked away in the book of Hebrews actually. And it sits in the garden of Gethsemane under the great pressure of what lay before him and in that setting, in that quiet setting at midnight sometime, Jesus shed tears. In each of those incidences in the life of our Lord, the New Testament writers present to us the tenderness And friends, that's what I'd like us to focus on this morning as we look primarily at Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44, the tenderness of Jesus. Now, last time we considered the gentleness of Jesus and we saw how he deals with people when we considered that. Though he acts with spectacular gentleness. Well, this morning we're looking more closely, if you like, at the heart of Jesus the God who came in human flesh, the God whose heart is full of compassion, the infinite Lord of justice who to all. As we consider then this, which I think is a precious theme this morning, the tenderness of Jesus, there are four things for us to look into and they will be these, the agony, the tragedy, the prophecy and then the destiny. Firstly, Luke chapter 19, verse 41, we see here what I'm calling the agony. And Luke records these words, Now as he drew near, Jesus drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Now that word wept, that word that the Spirit of God is actually a different Greek word used by John when he refers to the tears at Lazarus' funeral. This word that Luke uses is a far stronger word than John's selection. This word here doesn't merely mean that tears forced themselves up into the area of the eyelids there and then he sort of just spilled over and then ran down his cheeks. This word rather suggests something that is far more dramatic than that. It's the heaving of the chest, it's the sobbing, it's the intense crying of a soul in agony. You know the difference, don't you? You, We can shed a silent, no one else knows, there's nothing to hear. Or there are those occasions when there is such deep grief that there is a sobbing that is able to be heard by others. Well, that's the difference here and that's what we have here with Jesus. This weeping in verse 41 is not... 
And the emphasis here is upon the noise accompanying the weeping of great grief. In other words, Jesus is sobbing, we might say. Here our Lord, presented to us in great tenderness of heart, bursts into tears. When? What's the reason here? Well, it's when the city of Jerusalem... Now, what's the context? Well, we read the context before. You can see there in yourself, you go back and look at those previous verses if you didn't pick it up as we were reading it, it's describing his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. You remember that scene? It's a wonderful scene really. Some branches, there's the cheers, there's the cries of rejoicing of the people, of the children. All around Jesus is all this excitement and all this commotion. Jesus is coming. And there's a great uh, sense of excitement of this situation. Verse 37 again it says, And now as he drew near the descent of the Mount of Olives, of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen. This is one of those moments of jubilation. It's the Sunday. It's the last week of our Lord's earthly ministry. It's sometime Within days Jesus will be arrested, that's on the Thursday night of that week and by Friday afternoon Jesus will be dead. And so either this event that we're reading of here in verse 41, either it occurred on the Sunday or maybe it even occurred on the Monday morning when Jesus reached the temple and he cleanses the temple which is mentioned from verse 45. But whichever it is, whether it's on the Sunday or whether it's on the Monday morning, the immediate context remains the same. There's this overall climate among the common people of excitement. Something is really... But see friends, Jesus, he doesn't get caught up in the emotion of the moment. He doesn't get caught up in all the excitement. He doesn't get caught up in what seems like something is happening. No, Jesus here, when discerning, whilst at the same time preciously tender as he discerns. As Jesus begins to come down the side of the mountain opposite Jerusalem, he's on the Mount of there he gets a sweeping view of the city of Jerusalem on the opposite hillside as it were. They've got to go down through the brook Gidron and up into the city of Jerusalem. So on the other side they get this wonderful view of the city. This may be even the very last time that Jesus will see the city from his death. He turns the corner, maybe comes around the other side of a tree. He gets a, a, he's coming closer and he gets a look of the city and as he gets to that city, towards that city, as verse 41 says, as he drew near, he saw the city with that city. In this general context of excitement and jubilation, Jesus discerns the true crisis of the hour. The, all the excitement of the occasion didn't blur his assessment, so his discernment and in tenderness of heart. He looks at that city, a city, yes, with its magnificent walls and its amazing temple and yet there is our Lord, his chest cavity is heaving up and down as he sobs, but he's not sobbing for the building. People, He bursts into tears and he weeps out loud not because ultimately what would happen to him but what would happen to them. He's broken over those people. You see, Jesus doesn't have modern day cultural reserve that men don't shed tears. Jesus openly displayed to those around him, be that in the crowd or at least the disciples, the great agony of soul that he was experiencing due to his clear discernment yet in the midst of a deep tenderness. Why is Jesus shedding all these tears? Why is he expressing this tenderness here? Which takes us to the second thing, the tragedy And as we come to verses 42 and 44, you can see that these are the words of Jesus and in a way it's Jesus' own commentary on his deeds. 
There he is looking at the beloved city of Zion through those watery eyes. And perhaps it's a blurry vision that he has due to his tears. And maybe with a quavering voice due to his sobbing, he begins to explain the tragedy. And I want to focus on these verses. Firstly, the knowledge rejected. He says in verse 42, the first thing he says, If you had known... If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden, had known, knowledge rejected. These people that he is weeping over, these people were some of the most favoured people on the earth. They had the scriptures, while the rest of the world basically was in darkness. Three. Paul highlights the great privilege that the Jews had. Romans three one. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of search in every way? Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles or the scriptures. Of God. They had been given the deposit of God's revealed truth. The rest of the world's in darkness. Handed to them. These very people had had a long succession of true prophets. They had had a string of faithful preachers, we might say in our language. Hebrews 1, remember, says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the but not just in generations past. Even in their very own day, they had heard the greatest preacher ever. They had had all this knowledge placed before them, but instead of following what they heard, embracing what had been the, uh, preached and taught to them, rejected it. What mercy God had shown to them, but they rejected this knowledge. What a terrible Horrible tragedy. Jesus is broken as he looks over these people. They had rejected knowledge that had been given at heart and their own independent thinking. And now Jesus says at the end of verse 42, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Their persistence in rejection and unbelief had blinded them to the current opportunity through their own fault, through their own folly, these things, Jesus says, are now hidden from them. Not will be, but they are now hidden from their sight. Perhaps even some of those who got caught up in the excitement of their worship but with their grown up under much teaching had, had so much handed to them had heard a faithful preacher like John the Baptist And in more recent times, Jesus himself, they should have known. Jesus says, if you had known, especially in this your day, but now they're hidden from you. Look what he says at the end of verse 44. He says, because you did not know, here again is the same word, knowledge, you did not know the time of your visitation. They had experienced what Jesus calls a visitation. What a favoured people they were. Previously, they had had holy men visit them, the prophets of old. More recently, John the Baptist, who Jesus describes as the greatest man who'd ever lived. And now, of course, they had God himself, the Lord Jesus. They'd seen the miracles he had done. They'd heard the teaching that he gave in the temple. They listened to his sermons. Theirs was a day of the unveiling of the gospel of grace. Yet they would not have Christ. Though he had moved amongst them, though he had taught them his power to them, they had had a visitation. What a privilege. How about you, my friend? Has there not been special seasons when God has come 
He comes among His people. And when He comes among His people, He has brushed past you here. You heard His voice in the preaching. He prodded your conscience, but you shrugged it off. How many opportunities Don't be like these people and miss the time of his visitation because maybe today this will be the last visitation you will be given. Here is Jesus broken, sobbing. And how many Christian parents and grandparents can relate to the sobs of Jesus here? Young people and children brought up under the sound of preaching and teaching of God's truth. And maybe too, they have heard a string of faithful preachers and preaching. They should, tragically, they have rejected this knowledge for their own independent thinking. But worst of all, there can come a point that God hands them over to their chosen path. You see, it's the godly grandparent, it's the godly friend who, like the Lord Jesus, weeps much over these things. If we just bob it off and say, oh, well, that's how it is. That's what happens in churches. And we are far from the tenderness of Jesus. Jesus was amazingly clear when this was at the same time he was preciously tender. Now what did he see when he looked at Jerusalem? Jesus looks over the city of Jerusalem. What is that place in his day? It is the religious capital of the Jews. She's the temple, no doubt. And he knows what happens in the temple. He knows that that's the place for worship. And he knows that so much has been corrupted in that temple with man's thinking and man's traditions. The way of man had years and it had cluttered the purity of God's worship. Of all people, they should have known. Why? For the same reason God had given them the scriptures and in those scriptures was everything that they needed to know that he would accept. But they'd put those scriptures aside and they had added their own ways and true worship and ministry lay buried under all the man-centred worldly ways that had slowly crept in to that place of worship. And Jesus saw the city and he saw with clear discernment, the man centred clutter and in tenderness he burst into tears. And friends, when we look out over the church today, God's new covenant, what do we see? Not looking with a judgmental spirit. I'm speaking about that, that's obviously wrong but looking with our Lord's eyes, seeing as he sees with clear discernment, and not getting caught up in the jubilation and excitement that, oh, something's going on. But as we were exhorted last week from 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, remember what that verse says, testing all things, holding fast what is good, Yes, we see religion and there is much excitement, there is much jubilation, things in some ways seem to be happening. But don't we see the same as Jesus saw? The purity of God's worship in so often is buried under the clutter of man-centred way. Often these things come in slowly. The world's music comes in. The world's way of doing music comes in. A casualness that's a reflection of our society, not a reflection of what's in. 
women leading in a mixed assembly comes in as a reflection of the world's thinking, not as a conformity to the word of God. Scriptures are so often subtly put aside, not consulted as to how to worship or minister. You know that entertainment is just so normal in the life of so much of the Christian church today. The modern church, as I, you look on, the modern church, when it thinks ministry today, radically that means entertainment. We heard an example of this just this last week from a local minister in our own area who has been trying to get into a school at Lowood. Finally, they made the, the break. So, what are they doing? They are hiring entertainers to come in. The ways of man, the worldly ways, have cluttered the purity of God's worship and so called ministry. And their enthusiasm. We delight in that enthusiasm. But like Jesus, we must be clear in discernment, taking his thoughts of his word and applying it to a situation. And yet as we do that with clarity of discernment, we must have us in attendance as well. It's God's worship. It's not man's worship. It's God's. It's his ministry. And it's often been said, it's his work and therefore it must be done in his way. Like the Lord Jesus. Yes, they will have a clarity and discernment. But if they really like the Lord Jesus, they will be deeply grieving because ultimately the name of Christ is at stake. Ultimately these things are not a matter of it's the name of Christ. And it comes back to the reality that the knowledge has been rejected. The second thing we see with this tragedy and it's dovetailed in with this in verse 42 and we'll just briefly comment on it and that is the peace forfeited. Words about the knowledge, he says, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace... But now they are hidden from your eyes. Now that's significant, him using that word peace, considering what he is looking at. He is looking, that's what's in his gaze. Jerusalem, the city, has a name and the name means something. It means literally the place or the vision of peace. That's what Jerusalem means. But Jesus is declaring that Jerusalem had in a way lost its salam. Jaru, it's lost its peace. And rather it has become a vision only these people. Yes, they thought they had peace, they thought they had a, a, a blessing as it were, but it was only a, a vision, it was just a mirage. I'm sure most of you know what it is to the heat, go out west, not even too far out west even. Nice, long, straight, hot road. And you're in the car and you look ahead you think, oh, has there been a flood? There's water over the road up there. And the closer you get to that, the more you realise it be some rush. And friends, ultimately, the very ones these people needed in order to have peace, they had rejected. And if they thought they had something that was peace, get to it, you realise it's nothing. With the rejection of the Messiah went the forfeiting of their peace. By rejecting the knowledge of the truth, by rejecting Christ, they had lost their hope for peace. Of all the ones that he came to should have known him and received him. It's a tragedy. Here as Jesus looks out over these people with immense tenderness, they had forfeited that peace. If you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your... Now thirdly, 
Think with me of what we see in verse 43 and 44, the prophecy. Where Jesus declares something that will come. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side of the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is speaking to Jerusalem. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to those people that he's looking at. This is what's coming upon you, he says. Forty years after this, those words were fulfilled to the T in AD 70. When the armies of Rome under Titus laid siege to Jerusalem, they levelled that city. It was a precise fulfilment of these and other words that Jesus had said elsewhere. Jesus knows what was coming, is coming upon these people in the future. What's his response? Hardness? Uh uh. He is broken. Seeing perhaps the city for the last time, he burst into tears. Now, history does record that the Roman armies further the city, piling the dirt into great mounds which became an embankment circling the whole city of Jerusalem and the people were cut off. They were hemmed in on every side of the city. Josephus, the the Jewish historian, writing back at that time, Romans battled against the desperate Israelis. No one could escape. When people tried, they were captured and they were crucified in the sight of those who were looking on from the city walls. As food supplies became depleted, dreadful famine, he tells us that upper rooms within that city were full of dead bodies. That young men who once were strong began to wander through the streets like shadows, all swelled up with hunger. For a time, the dead were buried in the confines of the city, but also they had to get rid of those dead bodies and they simply threw them over the city walls. Josephus tells a a horrific incident, and I'll give you the sanitised version. It is a band of scavengers smelling food in the city. They broke into a home, they smelt this food, and they demanded that half a roasted body of her infant son. She was crazed with hunger and she cooked her own baby and she had already begun to eat some of the meat. Horrific. The armies finally conquered the city and its inhabitants. The city, or the fire, to the temple and the heat of the fire, we're told, was so intense that it melted the gold which overlaid the structure. The entire city was laid to rubble by the armies, as Jesus said, not leaving upon another. The words of the prophecy came precisely true. And all of this came upon the people because they rejected the Messiah. They refused to believe. But friends, the point I simply want to highlight this morning, though the the judgment was errity, Jesus pronounces the judgment with a, a, a broken heart. There's a tenderness in our Lord as he speaks about these things for the future. He is weeping, no doubt, as he declares this prophecy. He's weeping for these were real people who would suffer this before him in terms of the calendar. And very well could have been that when Jesus spoke those words, some of them who would end up being a part of the fulfilment of that may have been children around him at that time. The tenderness of Jesus. Is it? It's not where it's all headed. Jesus is headed somewhere. He is headed to Jerusalem. And that's the last thing this morning, the destiny. He was destined for Calvary the destiny. A few days after this scene here in Luke 19, after instituting the Lord's Supper, you remember the theme, that's Thursday night, after they've celebrated the Passover, in that context, instituted the Lord's Supper, they sing a hymn and they go out into the night. Jesus is taking the disciples to the place of prayer, out the city, up the Mount of Olives, 
to where the Garden of Gethsemane was located. Turn with me, if you would, please, to a couple of chapters over to Luke chapter 22. There in Luke 22, we have something of Luke's account of that situation. And we focus in on the tears of Jesus. It tells us, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And notice, without us getting into all the details, we've looked bloody sweat, but notice at least the great tenderness of Jesus in this situation. He is in agony and it's having an emotional, physical effect upon his humanity. That's the context of Jesus verse there doesn't say, I believe it is the context of Jesus weeping. Look with me now please to Hebrews chapter 5. I made reference to that passage right at the outset in the introduction. Hebrews chapter 5. We read from, naturally the focus of this passage is the Lord Jesus, the great high priest, Verse 5, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to who? In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly testimony. Jesus wrestled with his father in prayer. He knew not just what was coming 40 years. He knew on that Thursday about midnight. He knew what was coming the very next day at Calvary. He knew the miscarriage of justice and he sentenced to death and all that went on with, with Pilate and Herod and the Roman soldiers and Peter's denial. Yes, all of that, but particularly the, the pinnacle of it all at Calvary. And in his infinite tenderness, the sinless Son of God, he understood the sins of all those who would believe in him laid upon his pure soul. We see here his tenderness over sin. We see in Gethsemane him wrestling with that concept that sin would be laid upon him. We see in Gethsemane his sensitive conscience struggling as he was about to experience something for him that would have been horrific. And yet out of love for his own, he was willing to submit to his father's will. He looked to wrath, that cup that he knew that he would drink the next day on the cross and in his tenderness as he looks into that cup having not even yet drunk it, he is broken, broken in the garden. As the sinner's substitute, he knew that he would be separated from his father. Of his father would be turned away from him because that God cannot even look upon iniquity. And yet Jesus was willing to go through with this. Remember his prayer? Not my will, but yours, Father, be done. Why? To this that was coming on the next day because ultimately he has a tender heart for sinners. He would die so that we might through him live. He was willing to be cut off from God so that we might have peace with God. It was for that purpose that he was born into this world for this very destiny. Save his people from their sins. Oh friends, what a tender saviour Jesus is. So tender. And here the Spirit of God in these passages of Scripture unto him for us this morning that we might stand in awe and amazement and delight at the tenderness of Jesus. Will you not admire him with me, friends? Would you not imitate his tenderness? His loose?
under judgment. His tenderness to those who would betray him and deny him and mock him and even kill him. His tenderness to those who turned his back against him in in terms of his tenderness to sin. We see tenderness everywhere, don't we? Will you not worship him with me now? Will some of you, even you, not come to him? He is tender. God's tenderness. There is no one like him. (laughs) No one. He is unique in the proper sense of that word. There is only one of him. May we love him more. And may by his Holy Spirit he mould us and make us. This is an aspect of personal holiness, is it not? An aspect of our hearts and our attitude, our tenderness. Yes, clear in discernment, but especially tender in hearts.